we're talking today about the mystical thread following um, the series I've been doing on alternative, the alternative Christian or exploring the heart of enlightened Christianity. And this is uh, it's an important subject that uh, actually has been lost many different times. I was listening to um, a lecture given by someone over in England about, the, uh, about Evelyn Underhill who wrote the book Mysticism. It's uh, well over 100 years ago, I think. But it's an excellent study on that subject of, um, I think she quotes from something like 87 mystics that uh, she's run across over the, over the years. Some we know and some we don't. But what she was trying to point out was the church had gotten into the idea of ritual and dogma and creed and all of the things that we're familiar with, but had, had lost the living thread, the mystical thread. And the word mysticism itself, you know, she kind of, she doesn't redefine it, she defines it as it was meant to be thought of originally, and that is uh, practicing the presence of God or having a direct experience with God. It uh, isn't magic, it isn't uh, psychic, uh, doesn't come from the psychic realm, it doesn't, um, there's nothing mysterious about it, it's not mysterious. It just simply means the the practice of the presence of God. So it's an organic thing. It's not a memorized thing. And we have a hard time with this. We've all had high moments. We've had times when we've had breakthroughs. And I have talked uh, many times about this, the thing that drew us to a teaching like this, you know, that drew us out of a um, something that we would have considered an authority. And something very quiet in us said, don't stop here, keep going, keep looking, keep searching. And so we come to this inner place where it makes sense that this thing we call God is within us. And um, that's what the mystic says. And many of them stayed very involved in their, their church activities and you know, many were monks and uh, people of, of faith, of different kinds of faith. Some were not, but stayed involved in the church. Uh, one in particular, Madame Guyon, who is a, could have written a unity prayer book. She has a, a book on prayer, uh, which is online. Uh, you can download for nothing. Uh, and I would recommend it just to look at it. She uses Catholic terms. She was a Catholic uh, layperson. But she was a mystic. She was a person who had one of the a breakthrough that the church didn't get. And they actually tried to poison her, and they tried. They burned all of her writings, and they, um, you know, tried to condemn her to death. Uh, did did condemn her to death, but she escaped that. <laughs> but that's that's an old story. You get people that actually do what the religion says we're to do, which is have an experience with God. And they're considered heretics. They're considered uh, because they don't need the ritual anymore. They don't need that toll gate. They don't have to pass go. You don't know, collect a hundred dollars, two hundred dollars, whatever it is. There's a there's a uh, an understanding that the church is not the way into God. God is within us. And so the mystic says this, comes out and says it, and they are often condemned. Jesus was put to death, you know, because uh, he was a mystic and he was a, a person who saw beyond the ritual, but he saw the importance of it also. You know, that's, that's what's interesting about nearly all of the people. They don't just uh, do a wholesale rejection of, of, the, uh, of the ritual and all, you know, the prayers and all those the things. And how many times have you, you know, maybe said the Lord's Prayer and then one day you say it again? And there's something in it that jumps out at you that you didn't get before. You know, there's there's something about returning to that or to step into a cathedral. Beth and I, I just had remembered we were in New York City and went into one of the cathedrals there. And it was just this, you know, my first reaction, it's, it's so grandiose. It's bigger than I am. But then it also instills in you. It makes you feel like a worm of the dust, but it also makes you feel like, 
part of the cosmic process. So I understand what the architecture is trying to do, and it's a, uh, you know, it's an exciting thing, or it's an awe-inspiring. I shouldn't say exciting; it's not all that exciting, but it's awe-inspiring, where we know we're connected to something larger. So what I think happened with in the case of Jesus was he was a mystic. He was a person who tapped into this and understood it quite well, so well that he referred to this inner presence as his father. It made a, a very intimate statement about how he saw the presence of God. And I think that's probably an original statement. I think uh, Paul also uses the term, but um, we don't really see it before we you know, see the words attributed to Jesus. So, uh, and, and nobody really knows, but um, he uses that term over and over, the Father, the Father in me. And so we, the church has taken that, not knowing the mystic thread, and saying, well, it's his Father. You know, he's the, he's the one and only Son of God. That's what he was saying. You know, that's how the church sees it. And so what we have is we have sayings of Jesus dropped into a church setting, which is what the first slide is. The Gospels carry two messages. One is the developing doctrine of the early church. And with that, we're saying that the, the doctrine of the early church was not a mystical teaching. It was very ritualized. It was becoming very ritualized. The, dominate, the dominant theme of the early church was that Jesus is gone, but he's returning soon. And I mean soon, I mean any day he's returning. That was the idea, that was the, the reason for the gatherings and, and the excitement people might feel as the result of coming together and, you know, they lost their leader. They lost uh, Jesus to what looked like a totally senseless death, and it, and it really was. But, so he's gone, but now it's, they're beginning to say he's coming back. And so that was the hope. And so the church is thinking that way, the early gathering of the church, and that's not to say that all of them are, because as I pointed out, there were several several streams of thought. The Gnostics were very much alive back at that time. They were Christian Gnostics. And they saw Jesus in an entirely different way, but the early church, as it developed, tried to snuff them out, and they did snuff them out, basically. The only, one of the few surviving texts that we had prior to 1945 was uh, some fragments from the Gospel of Thomas. And in 1945, they found a copy of the entire Gospel of Thomas, uh, along with uh, a whole bunch of other Gnostic writings that had been hidden. But everything prior to that had been burned and you know, destroyed. Because the early church said, no, we don't want that brand of Christianity. We don't want that brand. We don't want that view of Jesus. That's not the view that we want. We want this view. And so that was a big struggle. And that struggle goes on to this day as to what that is. What is the church? I was listening to a guy. Uh, I don't know what kind of a, a minister he is, but he... Uh, this other fellow was interviewing him, but he was all about the Jesus coming back and all of this stuff, and I just thought, are people still doing that? You know, just like, we've been waiting around 2,000 years, and we don't get it yet. Maybe there was something deeper that he was talking about than this. But it, everything depends on that, and it's like all the textbooks are written around that theme, around that idea, so we can't change it because we'd have to, change, we'd have to say we were, we were not telling the truth. And that's what happens. But the mystic didn't have that problem because they saw it from an entirely different point of view. So the Gospels carry two messages. One is the developing doctrine of the early church. The other is what we're considering the mystical thread that runs through the teachings of Jesus. All of the writers represent the early church. The material they used, sayings attributed to Jesus, that's the mystical thread. So we've got these people that 
can only understand his message in context of the early church, and they're the ones doing the writing. So as I said, if I take a, uh, one of the Gospel of Thomas, uh, one of the sayings from there, which has no narrative around it, it just all these 114 sayings start with something like Jesus says, and then it gives uh, some teaching. But if I were a writer, and I took one of those sayings, and I wrote a story around it, and, you know, in 2,000 years, people looked at it. They would think that my story was the truth, not Jesus, you know, not who I was quoting, because I would quote Jesus according to my understanding. So they would take my understanding as his truth. And that's the problem that we have. So we have to sort that out. We have to find that mystical thread. And I think there's a way to do it. You've all heard this Jesus, uh, the, the statement attributed to Jesus, you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. I was using that in a, an article I was writing and decided to look it up and there's, a, there's a, an online uh, Bible study website that I use a lot. It's called the Bible Hub. And it gives, uh, I don't know how many translations, I counted at least 60. Uh, you know, you want to know the truth about what the Bible says? <laughs> 60 translations and counting. I mean, they're still coming out. But I ran across this one I never, had never seen before. It's uh, called the Bible in Basic English, BBE. But it takes that statement, it says, and you will have knowledge of what is true, and that will make you free. Instead of you shall know the truth, you know, we take truth as this absolute thing I have to know. It kind of softens that absolute uh, view. And you will have knowledge of what is true. And you could add in there, you will have knowledge of what is true of God. And that truth, that knowledge will make you free. It gives a whole different feeling to the whole thing. It's like if um, we say, what is the behavior of light? How does light behave? One guy, one scientist stands up and says, it behaves like a particle. Another one says, no, it behaves like a wave. And so there's two camps, two religions. You know, one's built around the particle and all the research that went into to that. The other's built around the idea that light is, behaves as a wave. And another scientist finds several problems with that that are kind of can't explain. So does all of his research and he comes up and says, the truth about light is it behaves sometimes like a wave and sometimes like a particle. So if we're in the particle camp, we're saying, this is my truth. And if we're in the wave camp, we're saying, well, this is my truth. So we're operating from my truth. You know, this whole religious thing is my truth. But this statement kind of sets us free from that. It says, and you will have knowledge of what is true of God what is true it's that knowledge of what is true it doesn't mean that you stop at that at some place because what does the third scientist come up with he comes up with a statement light behaves sometimes like a like a wave sometimes it behaves like a particle that's not a stopping point it's not a okay we've got it all figured out now it's a beginning point so what do we do with that? How can light possibly behave like two different things, the same thing behave in two different ways? It opens up a whole new, but because I'm free to, because I know the, uh, I have knowledge of what is true of light now, I'm free to explore even further. So it's a state of mind. It puts us in a certain state of mind rather than a, what is truth? What is the absolute? It puts you in a state of mind that allows you to experience the absolute. It's a completely different approach. And that's what um, you'll hear these people saying, ministers and so forth. It's like the, the way I'm teaching here is the truth. I don't want to lie to you. You know, we wouldn't teach it if it wasn't true. But really what a church ought to do, what a teaching ought to do is not give you a way to think 
so much as put you in a receptive state of mind that has you asking, what is true of God? And then you become open to letting go of all your past stuff that doesn't work or just doesn't quite fit, your particle-based or way-based thinking, one camp or the other. Maybe there's another way to look at it, so I'm open to that. I have knowledge of what is true. I have knowledge of what is true. What is true of God? And that's, that's a different question than what is God. Because in the what is God, I'm looking for a definite thing. And my tendency would be to say, well, God's like an old man in the sky. You know, I had this image that pops up immediately. Mike, Michelangelo gave me a good idea how to think of that God. So this idea of truth is not a hard, fast thing, but a way to think. We say truth is the omnipotence of God, expressing as the spiritual essence of every individual. And I know just without thinking about that uh, for very long, it may not make a lot of sense, but we start with this idea that the omnipresence of God, there's only one presence, one power. We live and move and have our being in the presence of God. All the power that is God is here. And it's expressing as my spiritual essence. So I'm one with that. And it's not just my spiritual essence, it's everybody, everything. So the mystical thread involves three things, and it's, it's embodied in this statement. But it, I'll break it down so we can get a better handle on it. It starts with the omnipotence of God. We say this all the time, the omnipotence of God, the, the all power. And when you think of God as power, you know, do you think of the old man in the sky that, you know, throws lightning bolts down to the earth and, you know, causes things to happen that uh, just thunderous things and all that. But when we're talking about power, omnipotence, you know, you go out and see all the things that are growing right now. There's a tiny little sprout coming up out of the ground, very frail. But that's powered. There's a power at work in that. And it's the same power that's at work in you that's looking at that, that's keeping you going. So we start thinking in a different way, and everywhere we look, every place we look. I was listening to a Benedictine, Benedictine monk <laughs> talk about his mystical experience and he was he said just the simplest things he said I was running a tub of water bath bath water and it was too cold and so I turned on some more hot and he said suddenly I was looking at the the waves the ripples on in the bathtub and he said the patterns just something about that experience he said it just took me to another place and I'm not suggesting that we go contemplate bath water you know or anything like that but what he was saying is life becomes something very different. It's like we don't always seek to be someplace we're not. We see God every place. And that's what he was saying. It was a, it, it was a, a simple thing that, you know, nobody could do on their own. It just, it's, it's a spontaneous thing. But his consciousness was tuned in to the presence of God. And that touches us in ways where, uh, you know, you could be talking to somebody and just suddenly you realize you're talking to an infinite expression of God. It just, it can come in all kinds of ways and it can be overwhelming. It can be coming from nothing at all. I remember sitting in my house one time looking out and seeing a maple tree in the fall, which was, looked like somebody had plugged it in. It was so bright. And it just kind of took me away. I remember that experience. And I've seen many maple trees. But there's a, there was a, there's a mystical underpinning in, in that experience. And how beautiful it would be if everything we do in our life is that kind of experience. And it can be because God is omnipotent. All the power of God is present always. <laughs> The divinity of the individual. If God is everywhere present equally at the same time, that means God is present in me. 
And as Al kind of reminded me the other day, a good ex illustration is think of the wave in the ocean. There's no place where the ocean leaves off and the wave begins, but the wave is an individual. We're all expressions of this power. We pray to God, and we're praying to God, we're looking away from that source, that power. And it's, it's, an, it's an awakening to what is within us. And then the idea of the relationship of oneness between God and the individual. What I'm saying with these three things is the mystical thread of Jesus' teachings, you'll find all three of these elements in these teachings in one way or another. Uh, the relationship of oneness between God and the individual, that goes without saying, but it needs to be said. If we're praying for oneness, you know, prayer's already answered, we're one already. How about pray for the awareness of that oneness? Act as if the thing that you or asking for it, you've already received because you have. But the awareness, there's a blockage. There's something saying, I don't see it any place. I don't see how it could be possible. So I don't think that this is true. I gave an example of grass, and it, this might sound like I'm going off in a different direction, but I'm not. That if you go out and mow your lawn, how many blades of grass will you mow in your lawn? Thousands, maybe millions, I don't know how many there are. But when we're talking about omnipotence, the all power, being involved in the individual, all you have to do is think about what happens when you mow your grass and what is happening in every single blade of grass. It's like it's all being addressed. The needs that they suddenly have, these blades of grass suddenly have, they're being met. And it doesn't matter if you mow your lawn and everybody in town mows their lawn, everybody on this planet mows their lawn at the same time, you can bet your grass will grow back at the same speed. The, the omnipotence of God, as we'll call it, is not depleted. Have you ever been dry, blow drying your hair and uh, your partner's in the other, another bathroom and turns on a hair dryer and the lights dim or your breaker gets blown, that happens in our house. I don't use a hair dryer anymore, but when I did, that happened. And we're used to that kind of thought of power that you, know, you, you can drain it. You got so much running and then something else can dim the lights somewhat. But that won't happen with grass. If everybody on the planet, I don't know what, if we can ever arrange an experiment like that, probably not. But if that ever happened, you would notice your grass will be just as high as it, in a week, you know, it'll be ready to be mowed again. But you think about it, it's really a miraculous thing and we just bypass it, these kinds of things. That what is happening when you mow your grass? It's like we say, how could there be seven billion people on this planet praying to God and get answers? And the answer to that is the same way seven billion blades of grass can have their needs addressed at the same time. It's omnipotence. It's beyond how we normally think. But our faculty of faith allows us to think in that way. So with the grass... God's power is evenly distributed. Every, every parable where we find the mystical thread of Jesus will find this idea, that the power of God is distributed evenly every place. When he came across the uh, paralytic that had been you know, paralyzed for 38 years, laid by the pool of Bethesda, the man thought he had to get to the pool. Jesus said, no, take up your bed and walk. He was acknowledging God's power is evenly distributed. You don't have to wait for the angel to come down and stir the water. Think differently, is what he's saying. And he proved that the man could take up his bed and walk right then because the omnipotence of God, that's a principle. And he called upon that. So that you find in the mystical thread of the saints attributed to Jesus. Some reference 
to the omnipotence of God. And you'll have to look deeper in some, some of these, but we'll go over them over the weeks ahead. The divinity of the individual. Each blade of grass contains the healing power. So when Jesus spoke to this man, that's what he was doing. He was calling upon that power, calling upon the man to become aware of that power within him. It's like the man was saying, well, I'm not capable. I don't, I don't have the money to hire somebody to take me down to the pool when the, when the, when the waters are stirred. And Jesus said, that's not necessary because the power's in you. So you'll always find some, some presentation of this, the divinity of the individual, as part of the mystical thread. This idea of oneness, the relationship between each blade of grass and its healing source is oneness. And see if you could uh, tune in to what a blade of grass thinks when it gets its head cut off. It probably would not think anything like we would. It just accepts that in stride and continues to go. In fact, it probably doesn't have the same level of consciousness we do where it, has, where it can say, well, I wonder how I'm going to be how we're going to fix this problem. I kind of don't think that's what's happening with the grass. It just takes it in stride and begins to express that oneness, that relationship between each blade of grass and its healing source. There's no place where that leaves off and the other begins. So we can look at that in a way, that the grass thing, and not think of it as such a miraculous thing. But we have a hard time translating that into our own life. But you'll find these three ideas uh, in what we're calling the mystical thread of the teachings of Jesus, as opposed to the teachings of the church, as you're going through the Gospels in particular. The teachings of the church are more concerned with sin, uh, the second coming, you know, Luke was big on giving up your material goods. Uh, Matthew said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Luke said, blessed are the poor. And Luke also wrote the book of Acts, where he had all of the early Christian community throwing all of their belongings into a pile. And it was the first communal uh, kind of existence where you give up all your property for the good of the whole. It didn't last very long, but that was the thinking. But the, the thinking behind that is don't get involved in material things because Jesus is coming soon and you will not recognize him. Don't allow yourself to be taken away. Blessed are you if you're poor, literally, because you don't have the problem of getting distracted. Matthew apparently didn't see it that way. He was writing to a Jewish community and he was not interested in poverty at all. So we have different views of what the church believed at the time. And all four gospel writers wrote to different aspects of the early Christian community. And they all had a different message is why they wrote four different gospels. But Jesus points out in... Uh, we're thinking about our grass here. If God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O men of little faith? And so you see the same idea, omnipotence. Talking about the grass, the power's everywhere. If it's in the grass, surely it'll be in us. That's the message. The oneness, the idea of oneness with, with that presence, the idea of the divinity within you. If God cares that much for the grass, which means all of these three principles are involved in the grass, how much more in each one of us? That's the mystical thread. It's a way to, to anchor ourselves in omnipotence. So the things we will look for in all of the sayings attributed to Jesus and the actions attributed to Jesus. Because some of the actions are church-oriented, probably written by the, uh, 
narratives written by the gospel writers, and some are things that he probably did, and we'll, we'll uh, point some of those out. But we look for the, any expression of the, the power of God everywhere, omnipotence. There, there will be some reference to that in the mystical thread. There will be a reference to God's healing, prospering presence centered in me. And again, it may be a little mask like the, the guy at the Pool of Bethesda. You know, you have to think about what's happening in the story. But Jesus didn't reach over and touch him and, you know, electrify him with his healing presence. He did something to change the guy's mind, to make him look and think a different way. Which means the power was already there. So that's an acknowledgement of the prospering healing, prospering presence centered in that man, centered in me. And this was a thought that I had, you know, through this whole surgery thing is, um, okay, I can't heal this problem on my own. It doesn't seem, but there's somebody that can help. And then the healing process takes over. You know, when the surgeon sews it up and bandages and everything, that omnipotence takes over in that in that way the healing I don't know how to do that neither does the surgeon that's why he says come back in a week and I'll take a look at it they don't do that but they trust that it's being done they trust there's a power in us that knows how to do that and there is wherever I am in body and mind God is and that's again the man by the pool of Bethesda I can't get over there where the healing is, Jesus says you don't have to. Stay right where you are. It's where you are. That's the message. And so when that clicks in our thinking, that I am perfectly placed to express the power of God right now, we stop reaching, we stop grasping for something we don't have. But these three ideas, just kind of keep them in mind, they're in your, on your... Uh, bulletin bag that we'll be looking at as we go through this continue on through this series all right thank you for coming out and again thank you for your love and support and notes and all the nice stuff you sent i really do appreciate that it makes me feel loved you've been watching a talk presented at the unity church of grand junction by reverend doug Bator. we would like to thank everyone who joined us here today in beautiful grand junction colorado as well as those of you who are joining us online. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, please like and subscribe to our channel. Also, please feel free to share this video with anyone you think might be interested or benefit from this message. If this video brought value to your life, please consider making a donation by clicking the link below to our PayPal donation account. Thanks again so much for watching.